Hello, I'm Pastor Timothy James Farrell, and I serve as the founding and lead pastor of a non-denominational church here in Bloomington Normal called The Tab. And I would like to invite you to join us for worship some Sunday morning at 10 a.m. The Tab is located at 1845 West Hubby Avenue in Normal, Illinois. I also want to invite you to visit our ministry website at thetab.tv. There's lots of wonderful resources and ministry there for you to take advantage of. Thank you for being with us today on this Tab Telecast. Here is this week's message. Good morning, Tabernacle. Good to see you all. Good to see you. You all look fuller and happier. How many of you had a good Thanksgiving this uh, this past week? How many of you ate too much? All right, it's confession time. I ate too much as well. So, uh, but it's good, isn't it, to be with family, friends, and it's always good to eat food. So, uh, so we trust you had a Thanksgiving, a happy, happy, happy Thanksgiving with whoever uh, you might have celebrated that with. And uh, I want you to know we're grateful for you. We're also grateful for freedom. Amen. We live in a country that gives us the freedom to gather and to uh, worship and, and express our faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we're grateful for you here today. We're also grateful for all of you that are watching us right now online via our tab telecast, whether that is on Facebook or YouTube. We're so glad you are here today. Like, love, share, comment. Let us know where you're watching us from. And if you ever get the opportunity, make sure to join us where and when in person Sunday morning, 10 a.m. right here at the tab. All right. Well, throughout the month of November, we're wrapping it up today. We have been in a series of messages called rattle. And uh, there we go. We got our dry bones rattling, I think, this morning once again. And uh, we've been learning lots of things uh, as the Spirit of God has been educating us, enlightening us on uh, on what what God is getting ready to do uh, on the spiritual horizon in these last days. And uh, the passage of scripture we've been camping out at uh, throughout our rattle message series uh, comes from Ezekiel chapter 37. And it comes from, again, an encounter uh, that the prophet Ezekiel has with God, uh, and it speaks specifically to the current condition then, and I believe now, uh, for uh, God's people, and specifically what God wants to do in the not-so-distant future uh, with God's people, again, in these end times, preceding the rapture and resurrection of, uh, of the church of Jesus Christ. So let's Let's learn once again and turn once again to Ezekiel 37, and uh, we're going to read about the valley of dry bones or the valley of despair and death and discouragement and dismay and depression. All of those titles we know could have been certainly labeled of this chapter. So let's look at it. Ezekiel 37, the prophet says these words, The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. Again, once again, I want you to see this in your mind's eye. So he sets me in the, in the middle of a valley, and it was full of bones. And he led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Verse 3, And he asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? And I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy or speak to these bones and say to them, quote, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 5, this is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you, and make flesh come upon you, and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. Verse 7, so I prophesied. Ezekiel says, as I was commanded. That's what prophets do, right? You, you say what God tells you to say. It's not a suggestion. So I prophesied as I was commanded. 
And as I was prophesying, I love this, we're going to talk about this. As I was speaking the word of the Lord, there was a noise and a rattling sound. There we go. And the bones came together. Say, get it together. We need to get it together. Amen. The bones came together bone to bone. And I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. There they are laying on the floor. Again, a dead corpse. Verse 9. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath or to the wind or to the spirit. Prophesy, son of man, and say to it. Quote, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath or the spirit entered them and they came to life and stood up. Some of they stood, stood up. <laughs> they stood up on their feet, a vast army. So after the dry bones rattled, after the body assembled, after the wind, the spirit, the breath of God entered their lungs, this vast army of, of, uh, of dry bones, what? They stood up. They stood up and they had what? The life of God within them. After revival came to them, after they were spiritually and, of course, physically awakened, uh, they came together, not merely, again, a vast assembly. We talked about this over the last few weeks. They didn't just, you know, stand up and they just got together and they assembled and they had a good time uh, and then all went home. They stood up, what? A vast assembly. <laughs> Army. Someone say army. All right. They stood up a vast army. And again, that was very strategic and purposeful on behalf of what God, uh, you know, was was wanting to do and is then and what is wanting to do now. All right. Is to resurrect and to bring back to life his dead, dry, dormant people for what? For a strategic purpose in these end times. In other words, God wants to resurrect dead things. God wants to bring the dead back to life. God wants to revive his people. God wants to revive his church. God wants to do something new once again in the earth preceding the glorious move of God in these last days. God wants to what? Cause not just dead, dull, dry, dormant Christians to live again and to experience personal revival. God wants to do that what? In churches to where there's a church-wide uh, revival, uh, not just local church, small church, uh, but capital C, the church, right, of Jesus Christ uh, to stand up and and to take her uh, place and to take her position as, as who? As the people of God and specifically soldiers of God. And uh, so we looked at this last, uh, last Sunday and last, I guess, couple of Sundays. And we've asked the question, why did God resurrect, cause his church to assemble and amass a vast army? Well, here's the reason. The reason we are assembled, the reason we are amassed as God people, God's people is because we are in a war. All right. We are in a spiritual war. All right. Between the forces of evil and the forces of good, the forces of darkness and the forces of light. And we're seeing this played out in the, in specifically our country today. All right. Uh, you don't have to, you know, be awake or alert almost at all to know that. Um, there's something wrong with, uh, with our country. There's something wrong with our culture and there's something wrong in our world today. All right. And uh, so God is causing us, calling us to amass and assemble as an army. Why? Because we're in a war. And we, therefore, are what? We're not just Christians. We're not just Christ followers. We're not just members of the body of Christ. We are soldiers in the Lord's army, all right? You are a soldier, I am a soldier, and, uh, and, and when these uh, dry bones assembled and amassed, they stood up a vast army, and they stood as soldiers do, at attention, listening for the voice of their commander-in-chief to what? To tell them what to do, because that's all soldiers do. You don't have a mind. 
You don't have an opinion. See, that's the problem with most Christians. They, well, I don't know. I don't believe this. I don't believe this. No, 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 no. You are, you are Christ followers. You are soldiers. And if your commander in chief tells you to do something, what do you do as a soldier? You do it. Or you get what? You get reprimanded. You get what? Demoted. And so, oh, that's good. So many Christians are on the sidelines. Why? Demoted. Because they haven't obeyed. They haven't obeyed. That's what happens in the, in the real army, right? It, you, you can be, you can be uh, kicked out of the army, right? If you continue to disobey. So we don't want to be on the sidelines. We don't want to be stuck uh, watching other, other uh, uh, fellow soldiers being used by God and seeing the goodness of God. We want to what? We want to be on the playing field. We want to be on the fighting field and to what? And to be a part of what God is doing. All right. So, uh, so we are standing at attention and we're listening to the voice of our commander in chief to do what he says do, where he says to do it, how he says to do it. And, and we're to speak what he tells us to speak. Now, uh, that takes time. I'll be honest with you. That takes standing at attention and waiting upon the Lord. And the, I'll be honest with you, as your pastor, you want to know what the heart, imagine this, every seven days you are required to get up behind the pulpit and speak on behalf of God. <coughs> His Word. And that's, that's what I try to do. Faithfully, I say, Lord, I have nothing to say. So you better tell me what to say. You better put thoughts in my head. You better put points on my paper. You better bring the scriptures to, to remembrance in my mind. Because you know what? If I get up and I just share Pastor Tim's opinion, nothing's going to happen. How many of you are grateful for a man of God that speaks the word of God? That gets in and presses it. Okay, we got two people. Two people grateful for, for I mean, this is the challenge. Because here's the thing. I can get up and we can say a, a lot of nice things. Okay, and that's all fine and dandy and, and everything. But I want to speak the Word of God. I mean, and, and sometimes the messages come on Sunday afternoon or Monday morning, and other times they come on Saturday morning. And we are, my tech team knows. I mean, it's like the closer we get to Sunday, the more Pastor Tim gets nervous. I'll be honest with you. Because I don't want to speak my words. I want to speak what? His Word to you. Because that's what's going to change your life. That's what's, going to, that's what's going to see results in your life. And so, uh, but that's what we're to do as soldiers. It's not just Pastor Tim. This is just, my, this is just my office. This is just my place, right? And I'm saying, hey, Lord, what do you want to say to your people? What are the messages? I mean, we pray about the message series and kind of the direction and all this stuff. I mean, I, what God's wanting to do. And, and, and hopefully it's not just me that's wanting to do that. It's, it's all of us. Each and every day at your place of employment with the people that you're rubbing shoulders with, Lord, you tell me what to say. Lord, you tell me what to do. Tell me how to do it and when to do it. And, and there's times when you want me to speak and there's times you want me to listen, right? So, uh, so because we're soldiers and when God says to do it, we do it. And when God says, don't do it, we don't do it. All right. Why? Because we're soldiers in the Lord's army. Well, if we are in a war, which we are, then it would behoove us to what? To know our enemy. Who are we engaged in this confrontation with? Who are we battling, uh, in this, in this war that we are in? Who is our enemy? Well, Ephesians 6 verse 12 tells us. That our struggle, how many of you have struggled this past week? How many of you had, had a trial this past week? Had a difficult day this past week? Oh, some of you only had maybe a difficult hour. All right? That's great. God bless you. Right? Some of us had some days of difficulty. Why? Because we're in a struggle. Our struggle. In other words, we're all in this struggle. We're all in this war. See, here's the thing. Whether you want to be in it or not, honey, you're in it. See, some people live in denial. Oh, we're not, we're not. No, 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 no. We're in a war. We're in a conflict. We're in a struggle. But watch this now. It's not against flesh and blood. In other words, look around the room, right? It's not against these, these fellow humans. It's not against people. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against who? Then he defines it. Against rulers, against authorities, against powers of this dark world, and against spiritual forces of evil 
in the heavenly realms. Now, there's so much in that passage of Scripture, but we're not going to break it down this morning because time will not allow. But the long and short of it, our enemy is defined as who? The devil. Write this down. Uh, your enemy, my enemy, is Satan himself. He's the devil. He's got a bunch of cohorts working for him called demonic uh, or unclean spirits. And then over them are a bunch of fallen angels. Now, again, this is an entire message series in itself. And uh, we've covered it from time to time. I probably need to go back and brush it off because so many people don't know who the devil is, who demons are, and what fallen angels do. But they, let's just say it this way, they're in rank and file. The kingdom of darkness is, is a military and the kingdom of light is a military. There are forces. Why? Because we're in conflict. We're in a spiritual battle. And uh, Jesus said, the thief or your enemy has three purposes for your life. It's not good. It's not great. It's not plans to give you a hope in the future. It's what? Plans to steal, to kill, and to destroy your life, your family, your finances, your health, your wealth, everything. Your mental stability, your emotional, uh, uh, you know, consonants, everything. He's out to what? He's out to take from us. And he's out to destroy us all. All right? So, therefore, it would behoove us to what? To, to get equipped, to get armed for this spiritual battle. So, the good news is, is the Apostle Paul, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, defined for us what our spiritual armor is. Now, last Sunday we talked about that. Uh, and God has given us spiritual, a spiritual armor, specifically five, all right, five pieces of spiritual armor. And uh, I updated my notes. I gave you a couple of uh, different notes so you could dra grab, excuse me, not drab, grab, all right, on the way in this morning uh, and updated them. There are five pieces of armor, spiritual armor that God gives us. And then there's five spiritual weapons. Last Sunday we talked about the armor. And the armor, if I can say it this way, is for our defense. Someone say defense. defense. All right. So we're in, a, we're in a battle. There's some times where you're on the defense and there's other times you're on the offense. Right. It's like any sport. Any sport you watch. You've got offense. You're on offense sometime. Then you're on defense sometime. And let's just be honest. Sometimes as Christians, we're on the defense, and that's okay. We've got armor to defend us. But then there's other times we're what? We're engaged. We're on the offense. We are attacking our enemy. So last Sunday's message, if you missed it, was all about the five pieces of spiritual armor. Let me just go through them real quick uh, for you. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of peace, the shield of faith, and the helmet of salvation. All of those five pieces are for our what? For our protection. And again, if you're going to war, you better, every soldier what? Puts on his armor. Puts on, puts on equipment to protect them in the midst of the war, in the midst of the battle. All right? Ephesians 6.13 says, because we're in a battle, therefore, put on what? The full armor of God, all five pieces, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your guard. And after you've done everything, stand. All right, we're going to come back to this at the end of the message here today. But after we've done everything to do, we stand our ground. 2 Corinthians 10, 3-4. Talking about the spiritual warfare we're in and the armor that we've been given. The battle and the conflict that we're in. Though we live in the world, the physical world, obviously, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons, now, he's, now he changed it. He's talking, he went from talking about spiritual armor, now he's talking about spiritual weapons. What are weapons? On the offense. The weapons, someone say weapons, weapons. that we fight with are not weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have what? Divine power or spiritual power, supernatural power to what? Demolish strongholds. Or we could say it this way, to blow up our enemy. 
All right, take him out. The one that's trying to take you out, we've been given weapons to take him out. And if we'll use our weapons, we will see our enemy defeated. All right. And uh, if you've ever had an attack, whatever that is, whether that's a physical attack, emotional, mental, relational, financial attack, you, you're, you're, you're on the defense. Then then you've got to what? You've got to come to the point where you engage your enemy with these spiritual supernatural weapons in order to what? To defeat him. All right. In other words, saints, sold, let me say soldiers. We're going to call you soldiers because that's who you are. In other words, soldiers, we're not just to take hits from our enemy. You know, I grew up, like some of you, I grew up watching boxing. Remember, you know, I mean, boxing was boxing, you know, okay. Friday night fights, you know, Muhammad Ali. Come on, now some of you know what I'm talking about. How crazy it would be to get in the ring as a boxer and just take hits. You got your gloves on, but all you're doing is just take, you, you don't throw a punch. That's lunacy. You're in a fight. What do you do? Yeah, there's times where you're going to take a hit, and there's times when you're going to what? You're going to hit. And the only way you're going to win that boxing match is to what? Is to knock out your opponent. Right? That's the goal. Because your opponent is trying to what? Knock you out. Well, here, here's the thing. You and I are in a spiritual war. And our enemy is trying to knock us out. And we've been, thank God, we've been given armor of God. Here it is. There it is. There you are. Look at your, look at your bad self right there. See, that's, that's, that's our armor. That's it right there. You're a soldier in the Lord's army. We've been given armor to defend against what? The attacks and the, uh, uh, you know, um, plans and plots and schemes and strategies of our, of our arch enemy, the devil. Thank God for armor. But we've also been given what? We've also been given weapons by which to fight back and to run him off and to defeat him. Amen. Amen. Because that's what we need to do. We need to defeat him because once you whip him, then he, don't, then he won't come back. And, uh, or at least he won't, he won't come back anytime soon. So, so we've been given spiritual armor for our defense, and we've been given spiritual weapons to go on the offense. Someone say offense. All right? So let's look at this today. Just as we've been given five pieces of armor, we've been given five weapons You've been given five weapons in your arsenal to what? To attack and to defeat the enemy. All right? So write these down. Weapon number one. Are you curious as to your weapons? I know you are or you wouldn't be here. Weapon number one. Here it is. Is the Word of God. The Word of God is a weapon. Ephesians 6, 17 Paul said, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So, right now, I've got, I've, got, I've got a Bible. You've got a Bible. On average, Americans have six Bibles. Six in their house. Those are six weapons, right? right, right. And, and it looks like a nice little, you know, harmless book. But if we could see this in the spiritual realm, it's a sword. It's a sword. It's the sword, what? Of the Spirit. Why? Because we're engaged in a spiritual fight. We're engaged in spiritual warfare. So I'm not trying to take out a physical sword and to fight the spiritual enemy because it's not going to harm him. All right? I'm taking a spiritual weapon, a spiritual sword to what? To stab and to defeat those that are assailing me, those that are assailing us, were to take out what? The sword of the Spirit, which is what? The Word of God. All right? The Word of God. Hebrews 4 verse 12 says this, For the Word of God is alive and active. In other words, it's living. It's, uh, <laughs> it's powerful. But watch the next definition. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. So it's not a single-edged sword. It's a double-edged sword. It cuts going in and it cuts going out. It's a spiritual weapon if we'll use it. The Word of God is alive. It's active, sharper than any double-edged sword. Watch this now. It penetrates whoo, 
to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and it judges the thoughts and the attitudes, what? Of the heart. So we're to use the Word of God. We're to speak the Word of God to our situation. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this, talking about the Word of God here today, your weapon, my weapon, our weapon as soldiers in the Lord's army. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful. Someone say useful. It's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Why? So that the servant of God, I would say, i.e., the soldiers of God, the soldiers of God may be thoroughly equipped. You're equipped as a soldier. You're given weapons. You're equipped. Equipped for what? For every good work. For every battle. For whatever you need this for, the sword is there. The sword is there. Yeah. So when the devil tells you, you can't do it, what do you do? You take out your weapon and you say, you're a liar. Philippians 4.13 says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Pow. Right? So the devil might say to you, uh, you don't have what it takes. Philippians 4.19 says, I have all that I need. Why? Because my God shall supply all my needs according to what? His riches in Christ Jesus. The devil might say, you don't have enough. I got more than enough. 1 John 4, 4 says, greater is he that's in me than he that's within the world. <laughs> See, I'm stabbing him. See, whenever the devil comes, comes against you, we got to come, come back against him. Whatever that is. Whatever that is. Uh, you know, if you're battling a sickness and a disease and your, you know, your body needs, needs healing. Uh, you know, there's tons of healing scriptures. I'm just thinking one right now. So Jeremiah 30, 17 says, I will restore you to health and heal all your wounds. Right? That's, that's that sword. That's warding off the enemy that's trying to what? Discourage you and defeat you in life. We're to use the weapon. We're to not just read it. We're to what? Speak it. We're to speak it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, you know, everybody else is going to heaven. Everybody, all the other believers are going to heaven but you. Well, that's a lie because the Bible says, all who call on the name of the Lord shall be what? Shall be saved. And all means all. And I'm a part of all. Right? And we use the sword of the Spirit. We use the Word of God as a weapon. And we keep speaking. That's, that's really what it means to renew our minds. In Christ Jesus, we renew our minds, what? To the Word of God. We got to get in the Word of God. You got to read your Bible. You got to come to church and hear the Word of God. Why? Because you're being equipped for the day of battle. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when you go to war. Weapon number two, all right? First weapon is the Word of God. Weapon number two that Paul de de uh, defines for us in Ephesians 6 is prayer to God. Prayer is a weapon. That you and I have been given by God. Ephesians 6, 18 through 20 says this. That we are to pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Whew. What, what do you know? Don't know what to do? Pray. All right? Pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Again, my, my life's work has been studying prayer. I wrote a book on it many years ago. If you don't have it, get it out in the Tab Cafe before you leave today. Pray in the Spirit on all occasions. Talk about all kinds of different prayers and how to pray. And specifically, there's 16 ways that God can speak to you. With all kinds of requests, with this in mind, all right, be alert, all right, standing on guard. Always keep on praying for the Lord's people. So we're to pray, and we're to pray specifically for who? For one another. Boy, I hope you're praying for me. I'm praying for you. Hope you're praying for one another. That's what we do as soldiers. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may, give, may be given me. Please do that right there. That's what I was talking about earlier. Pray that when I speak, the word of God will be given to me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am what? An ambassador, a soldier, right? In chains. Pray that I may what? Declare it fearlessly as I should. Boy, that's something that we should be praying for all of us. 
that we would be bold in, in proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ fearlessly, fearlessly, wherever you and I are at. And we do it fearlessly. We do it in love, but we do it fearlessly. And isn't it interesting that the spirit of fear has been released in our world today, not just America, the world. I mean, there's, most people are, are bound by fear. And we're to what? We're to not be afraid. God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a spirit of what? A love and a sound mind. That's the spirit we've been given. And we're to speak the Word of God. We're to communicate the Word of God, what? Fearlessly. And how does that come? Through prayer. Through prayer. Prayer is a weapon. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17 says that we are to pray with what? Without ceasing. We're to pray without ceasing. Wherever you and I are at in life, here's a nice thing we, we can pray. What is prayer? It's just simply talking to God, right? Talking to God, either on behalf of ourselves or on behalf of one another. We, we can talk to God, you know, as you're working out. You can talk to God on a walk. You can talk to God while you're driving your, your, your car. You can talk to God, you know, wherever you're at, whether you're here uh, in Bloomington Normal or, or on the moon. You can talk to God. You can even talk to God on the moon. Wherever you and I are at life, we can pray. We can talk to God. And it's a weapon. It's a weapon that God has been given has given to us. Matthew 21, 22 says this, if you believe you'll receive whatever you ask for, what? In prayer, in prayer. You know, one type of prayer, there's all kinds of prayers, by the way, but one type of prayer that we are, we, we, I pray every day over my family and over our church, over you all is prayers of protection. Lord, protect my family, protect our church. Come on now. That's, I'm asking you, God, God, protect us. We're in a war here. I don't want any casualties. I don't want any of us to die prematurely, to live out all the number of days that God's given us. Come on now. We need to be praying that for one another. We need to be praying that for our family, for our children, for our grandchildren, for ourselves, for our church, right? Prayers of protection. God, protect us because we're in a conflict. We're in a war. And God, uh, I believe you for it. And I believe you can do it supernaturally. Well, I, how about this? I, I believe you, Lord, to keep me safe from the covis. How about that? Lord, protect me. Protect me from, 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 from the virus. How many believe God can do that? Come on now. And even if I do get it, guess what? God can heal me and restore me to health. Even stronger with antibodies. Isn't God good? Even when the devil, that's Romans 8, 28. Even when the devil seems to think he's going to get it, God will work it all out for our good and for his glory. That's what God can do. But we got to believe it. We got to believe what we are praying and asking God to do. All right. Weapon number, talk about weapons. Talk about on the attack. How many of you are tired of just being on the defense and yeah. getting hit? It's time the devil gives, gets a black eye, right? Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I want to ruin his day. I want to ruin his day. And you can do it. You can do it. Weapon number one is the Word of God. Weapon number two is prayer to God. You got to pray. pray. Prayer is a weapon. Weapon number three mm, is praise to God. Our praise, our worship is a weapon that, that can defeat our enemy. Now, I'm going to give you some homework. I'm only going to read a few verses. Well, actually, there's a lot of verses here. From 2 Chronicles 20. 2 Chronicles 20 is a wonderful narrative uh, about the power of our praise and worship. All right. Most, most, most Christians just think, well, you know, we're just, it's a nice little thing to do up, you know, in the first part of the service, you know, we sing some songs and, and we say some prayers and, and it's all fine and dandy. No, it's powerful. In the realm of the spirit, in the realm of the supernatural, our praise and our worship is powerful. It's a weapon that drives out the enemy and not just drives him out, it defeats him. Amen. There's lots of scriptures. I need to do actually an entire series on praise and worship. Just an entire series. It might take me months. 
because it's, it's so deep. But there's just one passage of Scripture that illustrates this point. Let me set this up. You're all going to read 2 Chronicles 20 this afternoon, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's your homework, 2 Chronicles 20. The people of God, the Israelites, are coming under attack from three other kingdoms and other uh, military forces, the Ammonites, the Moabites, and, uh, and, and the people that lived on Mount Seir. And they're all coming and they're all going to attack uh, the Israelites in order to what? Steal, kill, and destroy them. To wipe them out and to take back Jerusalem. All right? And they are amassed together. So, p picture this now. It's three armies against one. Three to one. Militarily. How many of you are saying, okay, every one of you got to kill at least three. <laughs> it's three to one ratio here. We're going to win. Everybody's got to kill three men or we're going down. I mean, come on now. This is the, this is the, this is the setup here, okay? And uh, so the king of Israel's gotten together with the leaders and the prophets, and they're seeking God, and their knees are knocking. I mean, this is, it's go time. It's, it's do or die time. So verse 12, look at this with me. Picks it up. Second Chronicles verse 12 through 30. We're going to read this. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? Judge the, the enemies that are coming against us. For we have no power against this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do. One of my favorite verses in Scripture, 2 Chronicles 20 verse 12. We don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. Whew. That is so powerful. What do you do when you don't know what to do? You look up. God, I don't know what to do, but I'm looking to you. I'm looking to you for help. I'm looking to you for guidance. I'm looking to you for wisdom and direction here and for help. God, I don't know what to do, but I need you to assist me. Whew. Getting chills. That, that right there is a powerful verse. That's worth getting up and coming to church for right there. Lord, we don't know what to do, but our eyes are on you. I'd say they don't know what to do. They're looking over the gate and they're seeing all these armies. Now all Judah with their little ones. Now think about this. All of Judah, all the people of God with their little ones. Talking about babies. Their, their wives and their children stood before the Lord. Everybody get out here. We're having a town meeting. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph in the midst of the assembly. So they're all standing. I want to picture this. All the people of God, the kings, all the elders, they're standing and they're praying to God. We don't know what to do, God. you got to help us. you got to show up or we're going to come see you in a little bit in heaven. <laughs> right? And all of a sudden, this wee little guy over here hears the Word of God whisper in his spiritual ear. And he says, Listen, all of you, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you, King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Okay, here comes the Word of God. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, mm -mm -mm, but it is God's. Hallelujah. See, here's the good thing. When, when your enemy comes in, he, he thinks he's just battling you. Uh, he's battling God. Right? Yeah. He's battling God because you're God's kid. The battle is not yours but God's. Verse 16. Tomorrow, this is God telling the people what to do. Tomorrow go down against them and they will surely come up by the ascent of Ziz. He tells them exactly where the enemy is going to be. And you will find them at the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jeruel. Verse 17. You will not need to fight in this battle. Whew, I like that. Position yourselves. Stand still. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Do not fear or be dismayed. Boy, there's a word right there. Do not fear, do not be dismayed when your enemy comes at you. For tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Someone say, God is with me. God is with, God is with us, people. Verse 18. And the king Jehoshaphat, 
So the world, okay. So they're praying out to God. God speaks to this little guy over here named Asaph, mm -hmm. right? And he, and he speaks the word of God. He tells them exactly what, what they're to do. Then the king, thank God for godly kings and godly leaders. Someone say amen. amen. And the king Jehoshaphat, imagine this, bowed his head and with his face to the ground, got on his knees, and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem bowed before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. They got down and worshiped God. Then the Levites of the children of the Kohothites and of the children of the Kohorahites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with voices loud and high. Verse 20, and as they went out, King Jehoshaphat stood and said, all right, this is now the king's going to speak. Hear me, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem. This is good. Listen to this. Believe in the Lord your God, and you will be established. Believe his prophets, and you will prosper. See, when we believe in God, God establishes it. He makes our, our, our feet firm. But it's when we believe in the word that he gives his prophets and we obey that word that what? We prosper. We're blessed. So God spoke to them. God gave them exactly what they're supposed to do. Amen. They didn't just receive it. They're to believe it. And then if you believe it and you do it, you'll what? You'll prosper. If you do the word of God, you'll prosper. Verse 21. And when the king had consulted with the people, watch this now. People, you're not going to believe this. He appointed those who should sing to the Lord and who, who should praise the beauty of His holiness. And as they went out before the army, someone say before the army, and were saying, praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. All right, so King says, all right, here's what we're going to do. I need the marching band. I need the choir. I need the praise band. You're going to be up front, and then the army's behind you. So we're going to put the praisers out front. We're going to put the marching band and the choir and the vocalists and the drummers and the electric guitars and the bass guitars and the singers out front. And then the army's behind them. Now, that's not what you do on a regular army. You put the army out front, and then after the army defeats the other army, then the praisers come in and start, you know, playing their stringed instruments and dancing for victory. The <laughs> praisers come in last. The king says, no, 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 this is what we're doing. We're going to praise God first before we do anything. We're going to just thank God for the victory. We're and I, I mean, I'm telling you, I'm sure the band was like, well, what are we doing here? Well, 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 the marching band's going to walk. The flutist, going like, hey, this thing ain't going to do it. Remember, it's three to one. Three to one. And they're out there, you know, <laughs> marching. This is what was going on. I told you you weren't going to believe it. Praise the Lord for His mercy endures forever. Where are we at? Verse 22. Now when they began to sing and to praise, watch this now. The Lord set ambushes against the people of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir. Those are the three military uh, forces that were coming against the Israelites. Who had come against Judah, and they were what? They were defeated. Verse 23. For the people of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir to utterly kill and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, they turned and began attacking one another. The enemies of Israel turned and attacked one another. Verse 24. So when Judah came to the place, remember the river of Ziz? The river of Ziz. So when the Judah came to place overlooking the wilderness, they looked toward the multitude, and there were, and there, were there dead bodies fallen on the earth. No one had escaped. Verse 25, when King Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away their spoil, they found among them an abundance of valuables on the dead bodies and precious jewelry. Let me say, let me hear an amen from a, from a lady in the room. Amen. <laughs> precious jewelry on these, on these soldiers, these slain soldiers, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. You got all these bracelets going on. I mean, just rings on every finger, right? More than they could carry away. That's a lot of jewelry. And they were three days gathering in the spoil because there was so much. Whoo! 
And on the fourth day they assembled in the valley of Barachai. For there they blessed the Lord. I hope to say they did. There they blessed the Lord. Therefore the name of that place was called the valley of Barachai until this day. Verse 27, Then they returned, every man of Judah and Jerusalem, with King Jehoshaphat in front of them, to go back to Jerusalem with what? With joy. I hope to say they did. For the Lord had made them rejoice over their enemies. So they came to Jerusalem with stringed instruments and harps and trumpets, the marching band, to the house of the Lord. And the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of, of those countries when they heard that the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel. See, they didn't lift a weapon. They didn't do anything. God fought for them. Then the realm or the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was quiet. Another word for quiet was peace. For his, for his God gave him what? Rest all around. See, here's what happens. Listen to this. When God's people begin to praise and worship Him, it causes confusion in the camp of our enemy. And they turn and begin attacking and destroying one another. There is power, my friends, in our praise and worship to wipe out and defeat our enemy. The spiritual forces of wickedness lose their minds. And they start attacking one another when you and I start praising and worshiping God. When we send out the praise, when we send out our worship, when we thank God even before He does it, we call, a, we call that a pre-praise. Right? It's, it's one thing to praise after the victory. It's one thing to praise what? Before the victory. Remember, they were praising and worshiping God on their way to the battlefield. They get to the battlefield and every one of their enemies is dead. All of them. Laying there on the, on the valley, scratching their heads, and well, what happened here? God did it. As we praise and worship, the enemy turned on themselves, on one another, and guess what the people of God received? The spoils of war. They got the spoils. They got the jewelry. They didn't have to lift a finger. God did it. See, when you and I praise and worship God, it's a weapon in the realm of the Spirit. I'll just be honest with you. Without going into detail again, we will have to cover this someday when I talk about praise and worship. Praise clears the air. It clears the airwaves. Yeah. I mean, it's powerful. It cleanses the atmosphere. It, it, it cleanses our minds, our hearts. Just start praising and worshiping God. Have, have Christian music playing in your house or playing in your vehicle. It just kind of will remove the, the negativity and remove the, the mud and the muck and the mire and the, the words of the enemies from getting into your head and getting down into your heart. That's the power of praise and worship. Amen? It confuses our enemy and the enemy what? Will turn on themselves. All right. Weapon number four. Let's look at this. We got five weapons. The Word of God, prayer to God, praise to God. Weapon number four is words, the words of soldiers. Your words and my words are weapons. They are weapons. Proverbs 18, 21 says, The power of life and death is where? In the tongue. It's in the tongue. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 37, by your words, someone say words. words, by your words you will be justified, and by your words will you be condemned. How many of you know sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me was a big fat lie. <laughs> Come on now, let's be honest. Words hurt. There's words that have been spoken to you as a four-year-old that are still ringing in your head today. Some of you girls were said on a playground in an elementary school that you were ugly. No boy would ever want to date you. Those words are, they're weapons and they hurt. Come on now. They, they hit our heads. They hit our hearts. Words are powerful. Words are weapons. We got to watch our words. Watch what we say to one another. Watch what we say to our kids. Watch what we say to our grandkids. Watch what we're saying, what, even to ourselves. We can hurt our own heart. Words are powerful. They have the power of life and death in them. And we're to what? We're to speak life, right? Speak life. More wars were started with words than any other cause. 
this king said, said that to that king. And that king said something back to that king. Most fights between people, physical fights, get started with words. You said this about me, or you said this about my mama? Come on, then it was on. Right? Words. Talk about words. Proverbs 13, 2 says this, From the fruit of their lips, people enjoy good things. People enjoy good things. You know, in other words, when, when people speak nice to us, when speak, people speak words of encouragement, words of grace, words of love, words of blessing to us, right? It causes us to enjoy good things. The fruit of lips, people enjoy good things. But the opposite's true. From the fruit of lips, people also what? Suffer bad things. Suffer bad things. Come on now. Our words are weapons. Our words are weapons. Not just in the spiritual realm, but what? In the physical realm. Jesus put so much value and power in regards to the, the weapon of words that he said this in Mark eleven twenty three. 23. He said, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, quote, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be what? It will be done for them. It's powerful. Words are powerful. Words are weapons. Words are weapons. And we can use them for good, and we can use them for what? For, for bad. We can use them to heal. Come on now. Words can heal, and words can hurt. We can use our words to bring people up, and we can use our words to what? Bring people down. Words are weapons. And we can speak life. And we're to speak life to one another. We're to speak life to our situation. We're to speak life to, 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 to our friends and our family members and our children. Come on now. Amen. And here's the thing, too. And, and yes, we can use our words for, for, for bad. But there's a time, there's a time, too, where, uh, where we can use our words as a weapon to defeat the enemy. Mm -hmm. Defeat the enemy. Use your words. Tell, talk to them. Say, not here, not today. Come on now. I preached a message. Uh, what was it? I think it was this summer. Got a t-shirt with two words on it. <laughs> hell no. When the devil comes in like a flood, what do you do? You tell him, hell no, not going to happen. Not here, not now, not ever. You speak back to the enemy. You rebuke and reject and resist the enemy. You tell them, not here, not today, devil. Right? Because weapons, are, our words are what? Our words are weapons against the enemy. And after all, that's what prayers are. What are prayers? Prayers are words. What's praise? Praise is words. It's words. Our words of praise, right, are a weapon. Our words as soldiers are weapons. And we need to watch our words. Someone say, watch our words. Watch our all right, weapon number five. Our fifth weapon that we've been given by God is the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How many of you remember the good old story between David and Goliath? Remember that? Here comes this giant, you know, Goliath. How tall was he? I think upwards of 10 feet tall. Something like that. I mean, he was huge. Giant of a man. And here came 12-year-old shepherd boy David. And, uh, and David what? David... David knew who his God was and what God had done to him. 1 Samuel 17 picks up that narrative if you want to read that after you read 2 Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 20 this afternoon. Let's just jump to verse 45. 1 Samuel 17, 45 and 47. David has a conversation with the giant Goliath. Again, picture this. We got two armies. We got the Philistine army on this mountain, and we got the Israelite army on this mountain. We've got a valley in between. There's two people standing in the valley. There's this nine foot giant, and there's this four foot 12 year old. Shepherd against a mighty warrior. You got the scene? You got the picture? David says to the Philistine, quote, You come against me with sword and spear and javelin. But I come against you 
in the name of the Lord Almighty. See, David knew the name of the Lord was what? A weapon. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the what? Armies of Israel, whom you've defied. This day, then he starts prophesying, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. Here I am on a, right? I mean, he's looking up. He knew his God. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and cut off your head. This very day I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds and the wild animals. I bet they were laughing over there. I mean, I, mean, I think they were laughing, belly laughing. This kid's crazy. All those gathered here will know that it's not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's. Someone say it's the Lord's. For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give all of you into our hands. So David actually employs two weapons here. He uses his words. He says, listen, this one will do to you. I'm going to cut your head off. I'm going to defeat you, and I'm going to feed the, the, the carcasses of the Philistine army to the wild birds that are circling the air. He was using weapons, right? He was using his words, the words. And then what? And he said, and I'm going to do this what? In the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord, our God. The name of the Lord Almighty. Acts 4 verse 12 says this, Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Now, that name is the name of Jesus. We know that, right? You all know that, right? The name of Jesus is the name. The name of the Lord is Jesus. And that name is the name that's been given to you and me, to all mankind, by which, through which, and from which we are saved. Now, that word saved means salvation, healing, deliverance, and freedom. There's a lot in that, in, in that word, the, the, the word saved actually means uh, sozo, S-O-Z-O in the Greek. Sozo means saved, healed, delivered, and set free. So it's through the name of Jesus that we what? That we're saved from our enemy, we're healed of our, of our ailments, we're delivered, and we're what? We're set free. All in the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. Romans 10, 13, I quoted it earlier, but I be, it bears it to be read again. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be what? Will be saved. Will be saved. We call on the name of Jesus when we're what? When we're lost. We call on the name of Jesus when we're sick. We call on the name of Jesus when we're oppressed. We call on the name of Jesus when we're bound. And what are the results? Salvation, healing, deliverance, and freedom. Hallelujah. All in the name, the name of Jesus. You know, there's sometimes, you know, you pray everything you know to pray. And then there's sometimes, and that's great. And then there's sometimes, you know, the, the conflict and the battle is so strong, you can't pray. You can't praise. What do you do? What do I do? Here's what I do. I just say Jesus. I go around just Jesus, 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 Jesus. I mean, I just say his name because the enemy can't stand that name. They, they run in fear of that name. I mean, just, just say the name, just say the name of Jesus. 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 I mean, just right, right there. It was like an atomic bomb going off in the spirit. It just blows it. I mean, it just, it's, there's power in the name of Jesus. It's not just a little nice uh, praise and worship song. It's the truth. There's power in the name of Jesus to set the captives free. There's power in the name of Jesus to save the worst sinner. There's power in the name of Jesus to heal the sick. There's power in the name of Jesus to raise the dead. There's power in the name of Jesus to deliver us from the oppression of the enemy, the attack of our arch enemy. There's power in the name of Jesus. But we got to what? We got to speak the name. We got to say the name of Jesus. 
And as we call on the name of Jesus, as we speak the name of Jesus, as we watch this now, pray in the name of Jesus. We see what? We see results. We see the weapon used to our advantage to defeat our enemy. Well, the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church in Ephesus, addresses and speaks to not just the, the armor, the spiritual armor, but the spiritual weapons that we've been given. And he also speaks to the posture and position that we as soldiers are to assume. He speaks to the stand or the stance that we as soldiers are to take. After all of this, Ephesians 6, 10 through 11 says this, Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Take your stand. Someone say stand. Amen. Stand against the devil's schemes. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 6, 13, Put on the full armor of God so when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand. Someone say stand. Stand your ground and after you've done everything, what? Stand. After you put on the armor, after you've used all the weapons, what do you do? You stand your ground. You stand your ground. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says, Be on guard. Stand firm in the faith. Be courageous. Be strong. James 4, verse 7 says this, Resist the devil and he will what? Flee from you. We're to stand against the devil. We're to resist the devil. We're to put on the armor, but we're also to what? To use our weapons. As Christians, we are engaged, my friends, in a spiritual war against the arch enemy of our souls. Therefore, we must put on the full armor of God, ready our weapons, man our battle stations, take our stand against the plans and plots, schemes and strategies of Satan. As soldiers in the Lord's army, we're to take our stand and be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. Amen. And if we will, we'll see our enemy defeated and our God exalted. For after all, we've been what? We've been guaranteed and promised by God victory. But we've got to do it. We've got to take our stand. All it takes for, for, for darkness to prevail is for those of us that have the light to refuse to shine it. All darkness, has, the only way darkness and the kingdom of darkness can win is for us to what? Run from the battle, not run to the battle. If we stand, if we do our part, God will what? God will join us in the war. God will join us in the battle. Look at this with me as we close. Just some promises of victory that God's given you, God's given me. 1 Samuel 17, 47, we read about it earlier. The battle is not ours, but who? But it's the Lord's. See, we are soldiers in the Lord's army. Our five-star general is Jesus Christ. And He goes with us, and He goes before us into the battle. Isn't that good news? The battle is God's. The battle is the Lord's. Isaiah 54, 17 says this, No weapon of the enemy formed against you shall prosper. Hallelujah. See, the devil's got weapons. The devil's going to try to form and attack him. But here's the promise that we've been given as soldiers of Christ. No weapon of the enemy shall prosper. Romans 8 verse 37 says this, We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ who loved us. See, we're not just conquerors. We're more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 57 says this, Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through who? Through Jesus Christ. I want to fast forward real quick in conclusion in your mind's eye to the very last day of human history. Are you ready for this? Before it all gets recreated. This old world's going up in smoke, all of it. You all remember that, right? It's going to be an atomic fireball in space. But one thing happens right before the whole thing goes up in smoke. Here's what happens. We come riding with our commander-in-chief as soldiers in the Lord's army. We're riding horses, white horses, right? And we come, and we're standing, and there's going to be this great conflict between the forces of evil and the forces of righteousness. And there is our commander-in-chief, Jesus Christ. And He what? He uses a weapon. He uses His words as a weapon. And out of His mouth, Revelation says, a two-edged sword comes. 
and slays the enemies of God. And there's this great victory. For our enemy will once and for all be defeated. Hallelujah. And guess what? And all we have to do is just sit there on silver. <laughs> and watch. Why? Because the battle's not ours. It's the Lord. We're more than conquerors. And, and we'll say, thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. See, the armies of Israel that day when David went out to fight Goliath didn't do anything. They were up on the mountain. Mm -hmm. It was David in the valley. David did the fighting. See, we're up on the mountain. It's Jesus in the valley. Amen. But they won because He won. Glory be to God. We win because Jesus Christ won. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Put your hands together. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank You today for the victory. Thank You for fighting our enemy for us and defeating him once and for all. Lord, we give You praise. We give You glory. We give You honor. Help us to suit up every day with the armor of God, the spiritual armor that we've been given. Help us to use the spiritual weapons of warfare against our enemy to assail and assault him and see him wounded and see him defeated in our lives. And we vow to give you the praise and glory for it. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen, Amen, Amen. amen. Put your hands together. All right. Hallelujah.